I'm James Bayes at UN headquarters. This week, world leaders are gathering in New York for the 78th UN General Assembly. Among them is the Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte, who's leading his country's delegation for the last time. After 13 years in power, the Netherlands' longest serving Prime Minister is leaving office following a dispute about immigration that led to the collapse of his coalition government. On this edition of Talk to Al Jazeera, we'll be examining Ruta's political and diplomatic legacy. He's known to be a resilient operator with the nickname Teflon Mark. The Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Mark Ruta, talks to Al Jazeera. Mark Ruta, Prime Minister of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you, are, you for having me. You are the second longest serving leader in the European Union. You're the longest ever Prime Minister in your country, the Netherlands. You've done four different coalition governments. You've got the nickname, I believe, Teflon Mark, because you've managed to survive for so long. This time, though, you've decided not to try and form another coalition sure. government. You're going to stand down. Yeah. Why? I've now done this for 13 years and uh, the government was not able to continue in July because we had some difficult political issues around migration and then of course I had to make up my mind uh, whether I wanted to run again for a fifth term and I decided uh, after 13 years it is also the time to do something else. Not every country of course has a parliamentary system but when you look at the parliamentary systems uh, you look at leaders like Jens Stoltenberg, Norway, eight years in the UK, Margaret Thatcher, 11, Tony Blair, 10, Australia, John Howard, 11, Jean Chrétien in Canada, 10, it's only the German chancellors, I think, that beat you. Both yeah. Hermit Kohl, 16 years, Merkel. Hermit Kohl and Angela Merkel years both did yes. 16 years. Absolutely. Do you think there's a natural time for this? And is it that you get tired of the job or that they get tired of you? I think they get tired of me. Uh, so I did not yet get tired of the job, but I felt somehow, and it is difficult to, let's say, give you an intellectual explanation. It was also a bit of a gut feel that when the government had to step down and I was thinking that weekend after the Friday night when things went wrong, uh, what shall I do? And on the Sunday morning, I must say, there was this sort of epiphany where I came to the conclusion, uh, let's, uh, let's stop and do something else. And in the Netherlands, it takes some time. The elections are in November, then you have to form a new government. So you are, you are still stuck with me for some time. Now, in the Netherlands, you have a parliamentary system, as we say, but you also have a system which is built on coalitions, which yes. is unlike some other countries. You have a party list system, not the first past the post system. No. I want to ask you about that sort of system, because it means that you rule um, with a cabinet, yes. with people who are your political rivals. How difficult is that sometimes, to confide in people, to work with people very closely, and then moments later they're very publicly denouncing you? Yes, but, but, but basically we, we have done things like this in the Netherlands for over a thousand years. Uh, the, the, the Netherlands is a country, half of the country, below sea level. So you always have to negotiate where to build the dikes, uh, how to keep uh, the country dry, how to keep dry feet. And it means a constant tradition of negotiations, listening, trying to get to compromises. So it is in, in our tradition. And, and this was a four-party coalition. Uh, we had months of negotiations before we got there. Uh, in total, we have over 20 parties in government, uh, sorry, in parliament, four in government. Um, but it, is, it, 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 it works. And the Netherlands is one of the richest countries in the world. We, are, we have the, the most happy children in the world, number one. We are number five in terms of innovation. Uh, we are one of the richest countries in the world, so it is delivering, the system is delivering. The collapse of your coalitions, you just said, was about the issue of migration and I think about um, uniting yeah. refugee families. I don't want to go into the details of what happened in the Netherlands, I'd want to talk about that big issue. It because is a big the, issue. Because these words, migration, migrants, refugees, mm -hmm. asylum seekers, they've become the most toxic words in European politics. What do you do? about this, this problem is not going to go away. No, we are back in 2015, 2016, when we had a huge Syrian crisis, and uh, we were holding the rotating presidency in 2016. We were able to close the deal with Turkey and Greece as a European Union on how to basically um, yeah, handle and control the flow of Syrian refugees coming into Europe. That was successful. At the moment, we are back almost at the same numbers as we had in 2015, 2016. And I believe that is not sustainable. So you have to work on all fronts at the same time, particularly, of course, with countries in Africa, how to make sure that 
uh, they are able uh, to keep the people there in a safe place, of course, and, and in, in conditions which are acceptable. But we also have to work on the borders of the European Union. And within the European Union, we need to have a form of, let's say, uh, that we are uh, helping each other. And, and, and luckily, we are, we are moving in the right direction. But also at the national level, you, you need to do stuff. And that is where we were not able to get to an agreement. Because this difficult issue is the one that is fueling the far right, would you not agree? And there is a problem with the far right in Europe and beyond Europe. It's also the issue I think most people would say was a major factor in the UK leaving the European Union. Yeah, and there it was more, the, let's say, the migration coming out of Poland, so the, the internal European migration. Uh, and the free movement of people within the EU, which was a big factor, I think, in uh, 2016 when the uh, UK voted yes to leave the European Union. And I think, still think that is very unfortunate and has not helped the EU, but also has not helped the UK. Um, but it, okay, that is now the case. And in the EU itself, when we do not provide water, people will drink the sand. So if the politicians are not providing the right policies to deal with the issues, then people might move to the more uh, the parties on the fringe uh, and I think and that's my ambition with my party in the Netherlands the main uh, central right liberal party that it should be those parties which provide the policies uh, in a decent way to deal with these big issues. People like to make a distinction between the politically persecuted who can come in and the economic migrants but it's really not that clear-cut is it there are, there are there are places in the world where life is just unlivable uh, yes but that cannot be a reason uh, for us to then host you that's impossible so we have to make it very clear and make sure that we only uh, take in uh, migrants refugees who are really uh, fleeing from war from persecution persecution because they are gay or whatever the reason is that they are persecuted in their own country and we cannot accept people who are clearly only coming based on economic grounds. I understand what they are doing. Uh, but you, do, you would do the same, wouldn't you, if you were one of them? I think I, do, I would try the same, but at the same time I would understand that others would try to keep me from doing that. And in the end it is not good for Africa, for example, because you have many young, talented people leaving Africa. It is not good for the EU because we are not able to take in all these refugees. That's impossible. Let me give you one example. Um, Afghanistan. What would you say to a family from Afghanistan who wanted to come to the Netherlands? Because they are having a miserable life in Afghanistan and the reason they're having a miserable life in part yeah. is down to the policies of NATO countries like the Netherlands that shaped the last 20 years in Afghanistan. Well, first of all, of course, it is um, one of my big regrets uh, that we have not been able over the last 20 years to stabilize uh, Afghanistan, despite the enormous efforts, uh, the NATO and many NATO partners, in total 50 countries have been involved in the Afghanistan effort uh, to create some stability in that country and some economic prosperity. We had at one stage uh, 5 million children, uh, women children, young girls in education who were not allowed into education before. So we made progress, but we have not been able to, uh, to maintain that. And uh, if somebody tries to get to the Netherlands from Afghanistan, of course, it's always on a case-by-case -case basis whether you are eligible for, uh, to become an asylum seeker. It's not up to me to decide in the end. It is a system which will decide whether uh, you come from a country or a system or a background or a particular situation which makes it possible for you to become a refugee. Your country was one of the founding members of the European Union, the Benelux. Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg True. were there as the building block that started it all. In uh, the war, it, in 1944, it, it, exactly. the Benelux was created. And within the EU, you stood pretty firm on your values, which are free trade, liberal values, and you're very frugal with EU spending. Yeah. We know that's your position. As you now see the EU, after 13 years going to those EU summits with those EU leaders, What's wrong with the EU? What most needs reform? I think we have to speed up the decision-making process. Um, but per personally, I really made a journey. When I started 30 years ago, for me, the EU was first of all money, the currency, and the internal market. Uh, being a right of center liberal politician, free market, uh, that was for me the crucial point of the EU. Having moved through the stages in those last 13 years, I came to the conclusion that the EU is also about safety, not in a sense like NATO is providing the defense uh, side of safety and protection, but the fact that you are not alone, that in an unstable world, 
the Netherlands being a very prosperous country, but also a small country, that we are embedded with other countries in strong structures. So it is, it is, uh, it is market, but also uh, collective security. Uh, uh, the NATO is providing the same. And, and that's really one of the uh, developments in my thinking over the years, uh, having more moved to the center of the EU than I was when I started in this job. But the structures, do they need changing? I mean, every country has a commissioner, which means you have this cumbersome cabinet of yeah. 27 commissioners. There aren't 27 real jobs. No, that, that, that is a problem. There are many real jobs, but not 27. And if the EU would enlarge further, you would have some countries in the Western Balkans who want to join. Of course, we have the debates about Moldova and Ukraine who want to join somewhere in the future. Uh, so that means that uh, together with France, Germany and others, we started the process with a core group of countries in the EU uh, discussing how can we improve the internal workings of the European Union, particularly because we know that in the not too distant future we will have enlargement and then we have to make sure that, uh, that we are ready. Now, you are the second longest serving leader in the EU. The longest serving is Viktor Orban yes. of Hungary. Uh, in 2021, when Hungary was introducing a law which was seen as anti-LGBT, you said Hungary has no business being in the European yes. Union anymore. Does Hungary share the core values of the EU, do you think? Well, uh, I'm afraid not always. Uh, and for me, the LGBTIQA plus rights are key. Uh, all values we hold uh, dear are key for me because uh, the EU is, not, is also a community of values. Uh, the NATO, NATO is also an organization based on shared values of democracy, rule of law, uh, the equality of men and women, uh, that it doesn't matter from where you come, what your faith is, uh, that you are all welcome to join in our societies if you are there on legal basis. And uh, at that stage, and particularly with that LGBTIQA plus development in Hungary, I really was challenging what was happening. Let me ask you about another country that for nearly a quarter of the century has said it was going to join the EU as a candidate country, Turkey. Yes. President Erdogan said this week here in New York, if needed, we will part ways with the EU. Do you think Turkey has a place in the EU or do you think that's well, over? Well, here, here it is about the process and we have to be very precise. In, 20, in 2004, uh, the EU decided collectively and unanimously to open uh, accession negotiations with Turkey. Obviously, this is a very difficult process. Uh, because on many issues we still differ uh, with Turkey and some of the developments in Turkey have not gone in the right direction for them now to join the EU. But at the same time, I think we have to follow the process. If Turkey would make the necessary reforms, we can make a next step. But it is up to Turkey to do that. Uh, we all know what is necessary and I do not foresee Turkey to join the EU in the foreseeable future. Maybe never. And therefore it is also important that we have this new structure of the European um, a political community. One of the ideas Emmanuel Macron came sort up with. Sort of EU light. Yes, it is, it, yeah, it, it, it is basically the EU plus uh, the other countries being part of the uh, European realm. And uh, the UK now. And the UK also joining, uh, except of course Russia and Belarus, but all the other countries are part of that structure. And Turkey is a very valuable member of NATO. Uh, and my bilateral relations with Erdogan are strong. Uh, the the Dutch-Turkey uh, relations are strong and important to me. But on the question of accession to EU, we cannot uh, negotiate on the fundamentals. And there, I think, we are still a long way off. In your time as European leader, a European leader, um, one thing has changed in the political discourse. There used to be traditional media, television like this, yeah. radio, uh, newspapers. We were the gatekeepers of information to the public. Yes. Now anyone can publish anything. Are you worried about the real world effects of this? No, uh, because my view on this is, uh, first of all, that um, social media only have an impact when it reaches the mass media. So when guys like you, uh, Al Jazeera or CNN, are not reporting what is happening on the social media, it is not reaching the mass people in our countries. And you, as a responsible journalist, will always make sure that there is that uh, journalistic uh, eye to making sure that what is reporting in the social media has some sense. And secondly, I see some of my colleagues really being bothered by what is happening on social media. And I tell them, do your job. 
do not the whole day uh, uh, try to find out what on social media people are thinking of or about you or saying about you. It is not that relevant. Relevant is that you do your job uh, with the best of your intentions, with to the best of your knowledge, and then to be very much open to the media to report on that and, and to be questioned and, of course, also scrutinized. Let's turn now to the war in Ukraine. You've been one of the staunchest supporters of Ukraine and President Zelensky. You were one of the first countries to offer F-16s to Ukraine. Do you worry that as time goes on, Ukraine war is not always top of the headlines anymore? And increasingly, maybe some of your partners will start to reduce their financial and military contributions. There is that risk. And at the same time, I'm not too worried because what I sense when I speak with people in the Netherlands or with my colleagues in Europe and in the US, but also with many colleagues in Africa, Asia and Latin America, people and leaders understand this is not only about Ukraine. Yes, first of all, it's about Ukraine. It is a Russian aggression war against Ukraine. But this is also about two other things. Values, that you do not invade another country. And it is about collective security, the fact that Russia will not stop this Ukraine. So for my country, for example, the Netherlands, our safety, our defense is directly impacted by what is happening in Ukraine. And people understand that. When you became prime minister in 2010, Russia was still part of the G8. It seems a very long time ago. If I could ask you to recall then, what were your thoughts about Putin then? And of what course, do you think about him now? Um, uh, it has not really changed to us in a sense. Uh, I've never really trusted the guy. But at the same time, we were doing business with him. Because the thinking was, and here I would like to defend Angela Merkel, who is now under uh, considerable uh, criticism in Germany for her Russia politics. I think she did the right thing. Of course, we knew that with Putin, we didn't have the ideal leader in Russia. But we couldn't change that. And Russia would not move from its spot on the map uh, close to Europe, being part of Europe to, uh, for, to a certain extent, uh, because we didn't like, uh, didn't like Putin. And particularly after the Crimea invasion uh, and the whole Minsk Accord, which was uh, negotiated in 2014, it was crucial to keep the dialogue going uh, with Putin. Clearly, shouldn't we have be, not been successful. And shouldn't clearly, there have been uh, more of a pushback to Putin in that pivotal year of 2014 when Russia annexed Ukraine and then went into eastern Ukraine? And of course, very important for your country, what happened on the 17th of July that year. Yeah, and MH17 uh, killed 298 people, shot down yeah. on that plane by Russia. 193 of those people were Dutch. Yeah, 196 that, even, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, at that yeah. point, yeah. should it have been Let's not talk to Putin anymore. No, I think that would have been the wrong decision. Now, uh, after what he did on the 20, uh, in the night of the 22nd and the 23rd of February 2022, I mean, that was uh, the moment it stopped. And we had to squarely and fairly back Ukraine. But in 2014, in March, when the thing happened in Crimea, uh, which was of a different scale of what happened in 2022, I believe it was the right policy and the right thing to do to try with the Minsk agreement, uh, with uh, the peace negotiations happening at that moment, to somehow rein in Russia in a broader European uh, line of thinking. And clearly we have not been successful. And of course then MH17 happened and after that the Russia-Dutch relations have uh, never been like they were before and of course since 2022 uh, there are no relations any longer. Lots of people are still debating why Putin made the decision to finally invade, fully invade, in Ukraine last year. Some believe it was possibly because he was emboldened by the weakness of the West. Can I give you two examples? One, we go back to Syria and President Obama's red line on chemical weapons. Uh, when they were used by Assad in 2013, the UN and the OPCW, which is based in the Netherlands, both confirmed that had happened. Yeah. And Obama did nothing. And Russia then entered the war in Syria, and as we've seen in Ukraine, it bombed civilians, it bombed hospitals, it bombed schools. Was that a mistake, not doing something at that point? Well, let me also alert you to 2011, when uh, Putin uh, agreed with a Security Council resolution on Libya. And I think he, with some, um, and, and he, he had something going for him when he was criticizing what happened afterwards, and how the West then related to Libya. Uh, and the fact that he had reason to believe that uh, he was not dealt with in a trustworthy manner.
Because so of, because have, of, because a, a, a no-fly zone, in his view, became an air war. That's exactly it. And uh, so I think things started to sour, get worse from 2011 onwards. Of course, the red line not being held was not helpful. But go back to 2022. So when Putin invaded Ukraine, we, we do not know what exactly was playing out in his mind. Uh, it will always be guessing. But if he thought that we would be not united, that we would again say, OK, this is acceptable and let's have some nice talks and some tea and let's try to solve this. He has been completely wrong. And at this moment, he must think that he made a huge mistake uh, by doing that and that he sees the West being completely united, including the United States, bipartisan, including the whole of NATO and the European Union. And I think that is a marvelous uh, situation. Uh, not, of course, the situation in Ukraine, but the fact that we are still united. The second example I want to raise with you happened just six months before Putin made his decision to invade. And that's what happened in Afghanistan. That pull out from Afghanistan of all of those people who'd fought alongside NATO and the US, they felt it was a betrayal. Putin watched that. He also watched the chaos of that pull out. Do you think that might have encouraged him? I don't think so. I, I, I could imagine that the red line, Syria 2013, could have played some role in his mind. I don't think the pull out from Afghanistan, because um, all intelligence worldwide was that it would take months uh, before the Taliban would be able to take over. And of course, we were all basically uh, engulfed by the fact that in that one weekend on the 15th of August, things moved uh, and accelerated in a way we did not anticipate. And then we had to uh, move quickly. And of course, that was a, that was a terrible situation. Uh, but I would not think that that played a big role in, in Putin thinking. Uh, the red line might. Uh, but at the same time, what a terrible mistake he made and how proud we can be that the West is united. And we have to stay united even if things could get um, uh, not as positive as at the moment for Ukraine. If they would have to, uh, the setbacks and the battlefield. Particularly then, I would argue, we have to stay with them. Well, with regard to that, in one year's time, here in the US, there is a presidential election. And potentially, it could be President Trump yep. or another Republican who decides to completely upend the Ukraine policy. Does that worry you? Could Europe go it alone? I must say that I am really impressed by the bipartisanship within the US Senate. One on NATO. Uh, I remember the debates in the US when Trump was president on NATO and membership, etc. But there has always been a, a broad-based support in the Senate and particularly in the, in the Foreign Relations Committee on the necessity for the US to stay involved, not because of historical reasons in the Second World War, but also because if Russia would gain more influence in, for example, Western Europe, this in the end would also jeopardize US security interests. And the same goes for Ukraine. And when you look now, in, be it in, in the House of Representatives, and I spoke with six um, members of the House of Representatives two weeks ago, they visited The Hague, bipartisan, complete support for what we are doing. But the decision rests with one man, the Commander-in-Chief, the President. That could be Donald Trump. One European leader I spoke to in recent days said the return to power of Donald Trump would be an utter disaster. Do you agree? The US is a democracy. So the United States decides uh, in a sovereign way who will rule and run this country. And the one who is chosen in November next year and then takes over in January the year after is the one we will have to be on the dance floor with, as I've said before. Uh, but what and, if that one is not dancing with regard to Ukraine? Uh, then, then I still think uh, that uh, the advisors around that new president, uh, the bipartisanship in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, so in the whole Congress, will help us to make sure that we will stay the course. For 13 years you've lived a life of great pressure, at a huge tempo you're living your life. What's going to happen next? Because the job that your name has been linked to, you know this, it's been in all the papers, is NATO Secretary General. Jens Stoltenberg stands down next year, would give you time for a nice rest and do that job. Is it a job that you would consider if it, you were approached? Uh, at the moment I'm really focused on the job I'm doing now. But you're also passionate about the war in Ukraine and if you were NATO Secretary General you would still be able to play a role. Yeah. Is it something you're not ruling out at this stage? Uh, at this stage I'm really thinking about everything but uh, and obviously uh, after 30 years you are thinking should I somehow apply this experience somewhere else and at the same time I'm also t thinking very seriously of moving of making a complete uh, change of direction and 
uh, on all these roles like NATO and, and in the EU. There are so many talented politicians to take over. I, I would not be wor too worried. Finally, and you're still relatively young, so it's not an obituary question. Thank you for this. <laughs> I'm 56. <but laughs> well, same he age, is also young. Same <laughs> age as me. But, but, but uh, how do you want to be remembered as the Dutch Prime Minister? What is your legacy? I hope people will think that I did my best, uh, that I tried to get people together on, a common, on common issues, that we were in, in a very difficult situation, uh, Europe and the Netherlands in 2010, high unemployment, at the moment unemployment is low, we had huge uh, borrowing requirements and now the, the state finances are in a much better position and that means that we are able also to spend money on defence, on uh, raising the poor out of poverty, etc. So I hope people will say he did his best, he made mistakes, uh, but uh, it's also good after 30 years that he is now doing something else. Mark Ruta, Prime Minister of the Netherlands, thank, thank you, you so very much, much for talking to us. Very nice to thank, you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.